The name of this talk is Unfolding the Stone. And I wanted to talk about this. It's a departure from me because I think we've just been through a real hammering over the past 10 months. I mean, if you've still got your optimism intact, and believe me, I do, uh, you've been through the fire. This has not been an easy 10 months for uh, the people of this planet or the planet itself. And so I want to sort of reach back tonight and invoke a banished tradition, get to the heart of it, and try to show how we can bring this forward in our lives to empower hope in the most dark of situations and in fact to even make these dark situations the raw material of a clearer, stronger hope than might ordinarily be the case. A few days ago I was talking to a friend of mine and he wanted to tell me the story of sitting in the presence of a 104-year-old Vietnamese monk. And the guy had basically kept his mouth shut, the monk, hadn't said much around the monastery where he just sort of cleans up. But then he announced he wanted to talk about meditation. And he opened his remarks by saying, we are all luminous beings. Why then? do we not appear before each other radiant in our illumination? And this is the conundrum of life. This is the problem. Uh, it was T.S. Eliot who said, between the idea and the reality, between the motion and the act, falls the shadow. And why is that? As psychedelic people, this is the problem that we grapple with in our own lives and when we look out at the world. You've heard me say many times, we have the vision, we have the money, we have the technology, but why can we not then appear before each other as radiantly luminous beings? And why cannot we reclaim our planet from toxification, disease, overpopulation, bonehead politics, you know the list. What's the hang up here? What is the problem? Why is perfection so distant? Well, what I've learned from life and vegetables and travel and books can be summed up in two Greek words. The central message of, of the philosopher Heraclitus. And he was always my favorite philosopher, but whenever I would read about him, he was called the crying philosopher. And I had to live to be 44 years old to understand the poignancy of Heraclitus' message. He said, in a nutshell, Pontit Reyes, all flows, all flows, nothing last. Nothing is permanent. And this is the hardest message life has to teach. Because what it says is your joy is transient, your anguish is transient, your fortune, your home, your dream, your moments of great uh, ecstasy, your moments of great insight, your moments of great empowerment, everything is flowing through your hands at the moment that you are aware of it. William Blake, who in a way set this engine going a couple of centuries ago, said, <clears throat> what is the price of experience? Is it bought for a song? or wisdom for a dance in the street? No. It is bought with all that a man has. His wife, his home, his children. Now this is not a 
pessimistic message. And William Blake was not a pessimistic guy. He was the same guy who told us that if we could but cleanse the doors of perception, we would perceive the world as it is, infinite, in a grain of sand. How can we take this poignancy, this sense of impermanence, and weld it into something which is paradoxically indestructible and has meaning in our lives and gives us not only the strength to carry on, but the power to be exemplars, the power to stand up before other people and let them then feel the power of vision in the paradox of permanence in the face of the need for indestructibility. Well, to answer that question, I felt that we had to leave the narrow confines of 20th century thinking and we had to reach back into the byways of human thought that have been by most of us somewhat passed over and forgotten because after all modern life makes great demands on us it's enough to just keep your checkbook balanced and your insurance paid we can't all spend our time delving in the libraries of the of the noetic and Gnostic and Hermetic and magical tradition. But I thought it was worthwhile to talk to you about this tonight because we have been through such a difficult 10 months. And it was also Heraclitus, the all flows guy, who said, all is war, all is war. And what he meant was everything occurs in the presence of its opposite and out of that there is generated the friction, the heat, and the light that all comes together in an indissoluble package as part of life. So what I want to talk to you about tonight and how it relates to unfolding the stone is the notion of alchemy of all things. Alchemy, as I'm sure many of you know, is really the secret tradition of the redemption of spirit from matter. But many of you may imagine that alchemy is simply a, a discredited pre-scientific obsession of unbalanced minds interested in changing base metals into gold, lead into the stuff of commerce. This is the benighted reputation that alchemy has acquired in a century so given over to the literal and the material and the non-spiritual that it's lost all touch with the adumbrations of meaning that vibrate behind uh, the perceptions of the alchemists. The central conception of alchemy is the conception of the philosopher's stone. What is it? It's the universal panacea at the end of time. It's the chocolate cake that your mother made once a week when you were a child. The panis supersubstantialis. It's all things to all men and all women. If you are hungry, you eat it. If you're dirty, you shower under it. If you need to go somewhere, you sit on it and you fly there. If you have a question, it answers it. It's something that the human mind senses in itself and related to, invoked, worshipped over centuries before the slow rise of the patriarchy and rationalism and materialism turned it into a myth, a fairy tale. It is not a myth or a fairy tale. It is the burning primary reality that lies behind the dross of appearances. Alchemy is based on a philosophy called Hermeticism that was developed in the first and second centuries by Gnostic thinkers, Greeks, Jews, people inside the Roman Empire as it was beginning to show the first signs of degradation and decay who felt a profound disaffection with their world. A disaffection that 
on the scale of those times was as profound as our own existential disaffection. And the Hermetic philosophers drew back from the rise of Christianity with its doctrine of the fall of man and original sin and the stain of Adam and Eve and that whole thing and took a different tack and made two points which I think we need to recover and live out for ourselves. And the first point was that man, which means men and women, human beings, are divine beings, not lower than the angels, higher than the angels. The message of the alchemical and hermetic thinkers and the Corpus Hermeticum actually uses the phrase, man is God's brother. We have no idea what it would mean in our own lives if we could throw off the notion of ourselves as fallen beings. We are not fallen beings. When you take into your life the gnosis of the light-filled vegetables, the psychedelic plants that have stabilized the sane societies of this world for millennia, the first message that comes to you is you are a divine being. You matter. You count. You come from realms of unimaginable power and light and you will return to those realms. The second point that these philosophers wanted to make was that fate can be overcome. Fate can be overcome. Now for the Greco-Hellenic world what that meant was the starry engines of the machinery of fate that they saw strewn across the night sky because they were uh, intensely aware of the power of the zodiac, the stellar shells inhabited by demons that extended out to the unimaginable imperium of the All-Father that was beyond fate. And into that world of astrological fatedness, which is such a strong idea for the Greek mind, the Hermeticists announced fate can be overcome. And they had a novel answer for how this could be done. It can be done through magic. A word not often enough heard in the present world. The overcoming of fate is achieved through magic. And then the stellar machinery becomes not an invasive force into one's life, but an empowering force. Now, some of us may believe in astrology and some of us may not. We are all strongly influenced by the notion of fate, of our powerlessness in an existential world. Jean-Paul Sartre said, nature is mute. And we embedded in the media-dense, message-dense, programming-dense matrix of these hyper-societies that we have created often feel, I think, like hapless atoms running endlessly according to the blueprints and programs of unseen masters, whether it's the banking industry, Madison Avenue, whoever. We tend to disempower ourselves. We tend to believe that we don't matter. And in the act of taking that idea to ourselves, we give everything away to somebody else, to something else. So the rebirth of a sense of the stone and its possibility within each of us entails